What's up guys, it's Cassie and Sarah, and today we're talking about Ted Bundy, the lady killer. Yeah. If you like murder mysteries, make sure you hit that subscribe button and keep on watching. Ted Bundy was an American serial killer who kidnapped, raped, and murdered numerous young women and girls during the 1970s and possibly earlier. After more than a decade of denials before his execution in 1989, he confessed to 30 homicides that he committed in seven states between 1974 and 1978. He was regarded as handsome and charismatic, traits that he exploited to win the trust of victims and society. He would typically approach his victims in public places, feigning injury or disability, or impersonating an authority figure before knocking them unconscious and taking them to a secluded location to rape and strangle them. He sometimes revisited his victims, grooming and performing sexual acts with the decomposing corpse until putrefaction and destruction by wild animals made any further interactions possible. On a few occasions, he broke into dwellings at night and bludgeoned his victims as they slept. Biographer Anne Rule, who had previously worked with Bundy, described him as a sadistic sociopath who took pleasure from another human's pain and the control he had over his victims to the point of death and even after. Bundy once called himself the most cold-hearted son of a bitch you'll ever meet. Attorney Polly Nelson, a member of his last defense team, wrote that Bundy was the very definition of heartless evil. Dang, so even everybody on his team, team was, was like, like dang. He cray cray. <laughs> <laughs> even he was he's like, gonna lose. <laughs> it's like, what's the point? <laughs> even he knew. He literally said he's the most cold blooded yeah. person. But that was just kind of like a summary of like what's to come. Yes, just a little so, overview of t a little taste. A little <laughs> nib. <laughs> Ted Bundy was born Theodore Robert Cowell on November 24th, 1946 to Eleanor Louise Cowell, also known as Louise, at the Elizabeth Lund Home for Unwed Mothers in Burlington, Vermont. His father's identity has never been confirmed. On his birth certificate, it is said to assign paternity to a salesman and Air Force veteran named Lloyd Marshall though other accounts state his father is listed as unknown. Some family members have expressed suspicion that Bundy might have been fathered by Louise's own violent, abusive father, Samuel Cowell, but no material evidence has been ever cited to support this. For the first three years of his life, he lived in the Philadelphia home of his maternal grandparents, Samuel and Eleanor Cowell, who raised him as their own son, to avoid the social stigma that accompanied birth outside of wedlock. Family, friends, and even young Ted were told that his grandparents were his parents and that his mother was his older sister. Bundy occasionally exhibited disturbing behavior at an early age. His Aunt Julia recalled awakening from a nap to find herself surrounded by knives in the kitchen and Ted standing by her bed smiling. Well, that is like one already that's messed, like messed up situation. Up, so maybe that's where it all started. His aunt woke up surrounded in knives with him standing above her that's like me <laughs> hannah has stood above me while i'm sleeping i'll open my eyes and she's just well she's like sleepwalking or something but let me tell you what nope you no. know what Waking like up if you knives. know your uh nephew is already a little cuckoo <laughs> yeah and you wake up surrounded in knives with him just like <laughs> i would no that would be the end for me <laughs> that would be Run like away, i'm, never I'm moving back. out <laughs> In 1951, Louise met Johnny Culpepper Bundy. They married later that year and Johnny Bundy formally adopted Ted. Johnny and Louise conceived four children of their own, and although Johnny tried to include his adopted son in camping trips and other family activities, Ted remained distant. Bundy had different recollections of Tacoma when he spoke to his biographers. He described how he roamed his neighborhood, picking through trash barrels in search of pictures of naked women. When he spoke to Polly Nelson, he explained how he perused detective magazines, crime novels, and true crime documentaries for stories that involved sexual violence, particularly when the stories were illustrated with pictures of dead or maimed bodies. In his conversation with Chad, he described how he would consume large quantities of alcohol and canvas the community late at night in search of undraped windows where he could observe women undressing or whatever else could be seen. Bundy also varied the accounts of his social life. He told Machad and Ainsworth that he chose to be alone as an adolescent because he was unable to understand interpersonal relationships. He claimed that he had no natural sense of how to develop friendships. I didn't know what made people want to be friends, he said. I didn't know what underlay social interactions. Classmates from Woodrow Wilson High School told Rule 
However, that Bundy was well known and well liked there. A medium sized fish in a large pond. So it sounds like in his teen years, he was going through his neighborhood, digging in the trash for magazines and whatever else mm -hmm. he could find of undressed women. His stepfather and his mother tried to like include him with the children mm -hmm. and family things and he just he's like no you guys do your thing i'll do my own thing he just stay yeah stay by himself and then he goes on to say that he didn't understand why people wanted to be friends so that right there is kind of like mm, antisocial like, very you know? but yeah. it also says that like he was well known and liked so he knew how he knew how to like put on yeah. a facade but he didn't understand Stand. why someone would want to be friends yeah. with each other between 1965 and 1971, he had dropped out of various colleges and worked many part-time jobs. In mid-1970, Bundy, now focused and goal-oriented, re-enrolled at University of Washington, this time as a psychology major. He became an honor student and was well regarded by his professors. In 1971, he took a job at Seattle's Suicide Hotline Crisis Center, where he met and worked alongside Ann Rule, a former Seattle police officer. In early 1973, he was accepted into different law schools on the strength of letters of recommendations from Evans, Davis, and several University of Washington psychology professors. Reconciled with an old flame, Mm -hmm. talked of marriage during this point and then ghosted her. I think it's interesting though that he dated yet he couldn't even understand why people want to be friends so how could he understand? I think he just needed like a cover of like yeah like a um like, like you said like a cover like a mm -hmm. story to tell or whatever and I guess he said that it was just he wanted to know if he was capable of like marrying somebody I don't think he uh, oh really is. If if he can't understand why someone would want to be friends with each other, how can he have, like, intimate feelings with another human being? Like, I friendship is kind of, like, it's the similar. very bare minimum yeah, that's like intimacy. The, that's, like, the foundation of, like, a relationship. Yeah. <laughs> don't know that, the foundation. Yeah. yeah. Um, there's no way you can... No, but again, no. you're probably right. He was... Obviously, he had all of these feelings towards women if he was, like, trying to spy on them and look up magazines, but it obviously wasn't for marriage purpose or yeah. whatever. It was more than so. that. There is no consensus on when or where Ted Bundy began killing women. He told different stories to different people and refused to divulge the specifics of his earliest crimes, even as he confessed in graphic detail to dozens of later murders in the days preceding his execution. His earliest documented homicides were committed in 1974 when he was 27 years old. By then, by his own admission, he had mastered the necessary skills in the era before DNA profiling to leave minimal incriminating forensic evidence at crime scenes. He confessed to everything that he did, but he didn't really want to talk about his earlier crimes. Right? Because they were probably like sloppy and not what not he, he wanted. Yeah. Because obviously he perfected his craft or whatever yeah, they say. So his necessary. He's, yeah, he's probably embarrassed. <laughs> that word. Start with me. <laughs> so he probably like was embarrassed of his previous stuff. That was just kind of like. Shortly after midnight on January 4th, 1974, which is around the time that he terminated his relationship with Brooks, Bundy entered the basement apartment of 18 year old Karen Sparks, a dancer and student at. University of Washington. After bludgeoning her senseless with a metal rod from her bed frame, he sexually assaulted her with either the same rod or a metal speculum, causing extensive internal injuries. She remained unconscious for 10 days, but survived with permanent physical and mental disabilities. So this was his first, I think, victim, and he went hard. That poor girl. Like, first of all, how do you get a bed frame, a metal... She rod had, from her bed. I mean, maybe, he's like with a hole. Can you? Yeah, maybe or like it could unscrew I or guess. something. What I want to know is if that was like a thin rod, that would probably be like coming <laughs> out of her mouth, dude. I it kind of makes me feel like my skin is like crawling a little bit. Yeah, and like a little bit nauseous to think uh like that. Like it would it wouldn't have been like. 
gentle. It would have been like hard, like, like you know, like. But also, it said or a metal mm. speculum. When I think of a speculum, I think of you know the little duck. That's a speculum. Sweet. Yeah. Yeah. So she got one of those lying around. No, but it's probably something maybe in the same shape or. Well, for expen then to make like extensive damage. But still, if that bad boy was long enough, and he was just shoving it, not opening it necessarily. <laughs> but, uh, I mean, if you went, like, that on it. Oh my god. That, like, makes me a little sick. That poor girl. And she survived. She was unconscious for ten, ten days, days. And then woke up. During this period, Bundy was working in Olympia as the assistant director of the Seattle Crime Prevention Advisory Commission, where he wrote a pamphlet for women on rape prevention. Later, he worked at the Department of Emergency Services, a state government agency involved in the search for the missing women. At DES, he met and dated Carol Ann Boone, a twice-divorced mother of two who, six years later, would play an important role in the final phase of his life. He went It's, like, ironic how he is a disgusting man raping writing women, raping women, and then we're writing, missing now and writing a pamphlet for on how n women on rape prevention and search like in search of missing yeah. women. How ironic. I wonder like if he did it so that he was involved in the investigation maybe so like he knew kind of what he was going to on. like um disrupt like evidence and yeah stuff like, like kind of so he keeps tabs on where they were so he knew like oh I'm I'm gonna, gonna be caught yeah. soon. I need to I need change to. up or something. So, he's like, definitely ugh. a smart cookie. Like oh, that very smart. Psychology, you know, he went and majored in. Reports of the six missing women and Sparks brutal beating appeared prominently in newspapers and on television throughout Washington and Oregon. Fear spread among the population. Hitchhiking by young women dropped sharply. Further similarities between the victims were noted. The disappearances all took place at night, usually near ongoing construction work, within a week of midterm or final exams. All of the victims were wearing slacks or blue jeans, and at most crime scenes, there were sightings of a man wearing a cast or a sling and driving a brown or tan Volkswagen Beetle. I think I read somewhere he dresses them in blue jeans and like a white yeah. shirt. Yeah, I don't know if it's what he can easily get his hands on. Or it's someone in his past who dressed like that, and now he's, like, gotta dress them all like that. But people are saying that they see a man with a cast or a sling. So that's what he's doing to get mm -hmm. these women to get close enough yeah, that he and can attack them. He goes for, like, women that are, like, obviously in college because it meant... She's 18, so... Midterm or final exams. Like, or yeah. women in school. Well, we'll yeah. just say general in school. King County Police, finally armed with a detailed description of their suspect and his car, posted flyers throughout the Seattle area. A composite sketch was printed in regional newspapers and broadcast on local television stations. Elizabeth Clofer, Ann Rule, a DES employee and a University of Washington psychology professor, all recognized the profile, the sketch, and the car, and reported Bundy as a possible suspect. But detectives who were receiving up to 200 tips per day thought it unlikely that a clean-cut law student with no adult criminal record could be the perpetrator. They kind of just had like a hunch. They just outed him. Yeah. And the pe police were like, no. no. He's a law student. He has he, no criminal no. record. Come on. That's like, it's like with our last video, how it was just like all this stuff. It was like, at least look into it. Like, I get that you have, like, up to 200 tips per day, but if three people were all like, yeah, this one guy is hitting every mark, like, yeah. you'd be like, okay, maybe we should actually be serious about this. In the late afternoon of November 8th, Bundy approached 18-year-old telephone operator Carol Durant at Fashion Place Mall in Murray, less than a mile from the Midvale restaurant where Melissa Smith was last seen. He identified himself as Officer Roseland of the Murray Police Department and told Durant that someone had attempted to break into her car. He asked her to accompany him to the station to file a complaint. When Durant pointed out to Bundy that he was driving on a road that did not lead to the police station, he immediately pulled to the shoulder and attempted to handcuff her. During the struggle, he inadvertently fastened both handcuffs to the same wrist, and Durant was able to open the car door and escape. Later that same evening, 
Deborah Jean Kent, a 17-year-old student at Viewmont High School in Bountiful, 20 miles north of Murray, disappeared after leaving a theater production at the school to pick up her brother. The school's drama teacher and a student told police that a stranger had asked each of them to come out to the parking lot to identify a car. Another student later saw the same man pacing in the rear of the auditorium, and the drama teacher spotted him again shortly before the end of the play. Outside the auditorium, investigators found a key that unlocked the handcuffs removed from Carol Durant's wrist. Got, he lured somebody, and she got away. Yeah, he lured them by pretending to be a police officer. Mm-hmm. And then he was like, here, I'm not, well, when she was like, you're going the wrong way, he was like, no, I'm not. No, Pulled I'm over. Not. Put her handcuff on the same, same wrist. wrist. Whatever, I don't know. And then she's Things like, Things must have been moving too fast. And I like, guess. And then she, like, busted out the door. I don't know why he wouldn't go after her. Like, if she opened the door and went out. Maybe it's too know. much traffic. Maybe. And he didn't want to, like, cause a scene, so he just let her go. And then that same day, like, towards the evening, he got a 17-year-old girl. In 1975, Bundy shifted much of his criminal activity eastward from his base in Utah to Colorado. In Washington State, investigators were still struggling to analyze the Pacific Northwest murder spree that had ended as abruptly as it had begun. They used the King County payroll computer, but the one, only one available for their use. After inputting the many lists they had compiled, classmates and acquaintances of each victim, Volkswagen owners named Ted, known sex offenders, and so on, they queried the computer for coincidences. Out of thousands of names, 26 turned up on four lists. One was Ted Bundy. Detectives also manually compiled a list of their 100 best suspects, and Bundy was on that list as well. He was literally at the top of the pile of suspects when word came from Utah of his arrest. He was like the top of like every list yeah. that they like compiled. So, um, yeah, you got caught, bro. I would hope so. Now it's just like the means of trying Catch to him. locate him. Yeah. Yeah, we're leaving out like a lot of the victims just because there's so many. Like there's over 30. We'll, so. Yeah, we'll read it at the end, but there's a lot. On August 16, 1975, Bundy was arrested by Utah Highway Patrol Officer Bob Hayward in Granger, another Salt Lake City suburb. Hayward had observed Bundy cruising a residential area in the pre-dawn hours. Bundy fled the area at high speed after seeing the patrol car. The officer searched the car after he noticed that the Volkswagen's front passenger seat had been removed and placed on the rear seats. He found a ski mask a second mask fashioned from pantyhose, a crowbar, handcuffs, trash bags, a coil of rope, an ice pick, and other items initially assumed to be burglary tools. Bundy explained that the ski mask was for skiing, he had found the handcuffs in a dumpster, and the rest were common household items. The police did not have sufficient evidence to detain Bundy, and he was released on his own recognizance. Bundy later said that searchers missed a hidden collection of Polaroid photographs of his victims, which he destroyed after he was released. So, <laughs> the ski mask is for skiing. Yeah. Um, and uh -huh. he found the handcuffs in a dumpster. First of all, why are you dumpster diving? For handcuffs? And then the rest were household items. What the? How is... An ice pick? An ice pick. I don't have an ice pick I at my house. <laughs> but again, you have to remember that Bundy was very he's good at manipulating people, mm -hmm. very charming, very like, you wanted to like him, so it's no surprise that the police officer didn't look into it too much and just took his word for it. It's just frustrating, like, as an outsider to be like reading this and being like, I hate you, I could have done a better job. <laughs> <laughs> no, but probably at the inch. time, it probably wasn't as easy as we think it is. In September, Bundy sold his Volkswagen Beetle to a Midvale teenager. Utah police impounded it, and FBI technicians dismantled and searched it. They found hairs matching samples obtained from Karen Campbell's body. Later, they also identified hair strands, microscopically indistinguishable from those of Melissa Smith and Carol Durant. On October 2nd, detectives put Bundy into a lineup. 
Durant immediately identified him as Officer Roslin, and witnesses from Bountiful recognized him as the stranger at the high school auditorium. The teenager is probably crapping bullets when you got the FBI and the police <laughs> taking it. He's right? Like, and he's like, oh, I would have been like, deer in the headlights. <laughs> like, oh, um, something that we didn't mention. Oh, so with the chair that was like removed, he basically took it and like push it into the back so that he could get his victims into the car and have them laying down in the front yeah so they cause... couldn't be seen by anybody else driving by yeah um so there's just a little tip of knowledge a lot of the names that we mention are victims um, if they're like women yeah they're victims typically unless we say otherwise there was insufficient evidence to link him to Deborah Kent, whose body was never found, though a skeleton fragment found near the school was later identified as Kent's by DNA analysis. There was more than enough evidence to charge him with aggravated kidnapping and attempted criminal assault in the Durant case. He was freed on $15,000 bail, paid by his parents, and spent most of the time between indictment and trial in Seattle, living in Clover's house. Why would his parents bail him out? Because he fucking stupid. He, they're He's stupid. the main suspect in all of these, like, murder cases, and they're like, we're gonna get you out of jail, but don't worry. Don't worry. Why would you, you do that? If that was my kid, I'd be like, see ya. See ya. Like, I get that you they're your kid, but, freaking yeah. Lesson. I get that they're your child and whatever, but... Like, come to the point when they have to deal with their, their consequences. consequences. Seattle police had insufficient evidence to charge him in the Pacific Northwest murders, but kept him under close surveillance. In February 1976, Bundy stood trial for the Durant kidnapping. On the advice of his attorney, John O'Connell, Bundy waived his rights to a jury due to the negative publicity surrounding the case. After a four-day bench trial and a weekend of deliberation, Judge Stuart Hansen Jr. found him guilty of kidnapping and assault. In June, he was sentenced to 1 to 15 years in the Utah State Prison. To prison! Yeah, but only to 1 to 15 years because they couldn't link him to any murders yeah. yet. Just So, kidnapping. he'll probably go to jail and probably, if he's smart, get out on good behavior. behavior. In October, he was found hiding in bushes in the prison yard carrying an escape kit, road maps, airline schedules, and a social security card, and spent several weeks in solitary confinement. Later that month, Colorado authorities charged him with Karen Campbell's murder. After a period of resistance, he waived extradition proceedings and was transferred to Aspen in January 1977. So this guy got had a little escape kit. Like, He's like, just trying to get out, or <laughs> whatever. <laughs> like, you think you can hide in the bushes, dude? I mean, come on. He's just hiding in the bushes. He's like, <laughs> oh, oh, he sees me. Because <laughs> I can't imagine there's that many bushes at like, a prison yard no. for that exact reason. During a recess, he asked to visit the courthouse's law library to research his case. While shielded from his guard's view behind a bookcase, he opened a window and jumped to the ground from the second story, injuring his right ankle as he landed. After shedding his outer layer of clothing, he walked through Aspen as roadblocks were being set up on its outskirts, then hiked southward onto Aspen Mountain. Near its summit, he broke into a hunting cabin and stole food, clothing, and a rifle. The following day, he left the cabin and continued south toward the town of Crested Butte, but became lost in the forest. For two days, he wandered aimlessly on the mountain, missing two trails that led downward to his intended destination. On June 10th, he broke into a camping trailer on Maroon Lake, 10 miles south of Aspen, taking food and a ski parka, but instead of continuing southward, he walked back north toward Aspen eluding roadblocks and search parties along the way. Three days later, he stole a car at the edge of Aspen Golf Course. Cold, sleep-deprived, and in constant pain from a sprained ankle, he drove back into Aspen, where two police officers noticed his car weaving in and out of its lane and pulled him over. He had been a fugitive for six days. In the car were maps of the mountain area around Aspen that prosecutors were using to demonstrate the location of Karen Campbell's body as his own attorney, Bundy had rights of discovery, indicating that his escape was not a spontaneous act, but had been planned. He jumped out a library window! <laughs> he jumped out a window! First of all, why not throw bars on the exactly. window? Exactly! 
Do you if, think nobody's gonna try to climb out of that? Exactly. If you have a bunch of inmates that are allowed to use this library, which... Okay, they should be, whatever. Yeah. But why isn't the window locked or barred or anything? Back in jail in Glenwood Springs, Bundy ignored the advice of friends and legal advisors to stay put. The case against him, already weak at best, but deteriorating steadily as pre-trial motions consistently revolved in his favor and significant bits of evidence were ruled inadmissible. Instead, Bundy assembled a new escape plan. He acquired a detailed floor plan of the jail and a hacksaw blade from other inmates and accumulated $500 in cash smuggled in over a six-month period. He later said by visitors, Carol Ann Boone in particular. During the evenings, while other prisoners were showering, he sawed a hole about one square foot between the steel reinforcing bars and his cell's ceiling and having lost 35 pounds, was able to wiggle through it into the crawl space above. In the weeks that followed, he made a series of practice runs exploring the space. Multiple reports from an informant of movement within the ceiling during the night was not investigated. On the night of December 30th, with most of the jail staff on Christmas break and nonviolent prisoners on furlough with their families, Bundy piled books and files in his bed, covered them with a blanket to simulate his sleeping body, and climbed into the crawl space. He broke through the ceiling into the apartment of the chief jailer, who was out for the evening with his wife, changed into street clothes from the jailer's closet, and walked out the front door to freedom. After stealing a car, Bundy drove eastward out of Glenwood Springs, but the car soon broke down in the mountains on Interstate 70. A passing motorist gave him a ride into Vail, 60 miles to the east. From there, he caught a bus to Denver, where he boarded a morning flight to Chicago. In Glenwood Springs, the jail skeleton crew did not discover the escape until noon on December 31st, more than 17 hours later. By then, he was already in Chicago. He broke out of jail, not once, but, but twice. twice. And he's in Chicago now. Nobody checked the the cells? Well, apparently, it seemed like the, all everybody? the- Everybody? Everybody was out for break. I don't think that's how jail works. No! <laughs> There's gotta be somebody- There's gotta be enough staff, staff there. to- What if there was like a serious issue? Like, no, well, they gonna die then. then. Through various means of travel, he went from Chicago to Michigan. Five days later, he stole a car and drove to Atlanta, where he boarded a bus and arrived in Tallahassee, Florida, on the morning of January 8th. He rented a room under the alias Chris Hagen at the Holiday Inn near the Florida State University campus. He reverted to his old habits of shoplifting and stealing credit cards from women's wallets left in shopping carts. In the early hours of January 15, 1978, one week after his arrival in Tallahassee, Bundy entered FSU's Chi Omega sorority house through a rear door with a faulty locking mechanism. Beginning at about 2.45 a.m., he bludgeoned Margaret Bowman, 21, with a piece of oak firewood as she slept, then garroted her with a nylon stocking. He then entered the bedroom of 20-year-old Lisa Levy and beat her unconscious, strangled her, tore one of her nipples, bit deeply into her left buttock, and sexually assaulted her with a hair mist bottle. In an adjoining bedroom, he attacked Kathy Kleiner, breaking her jaw and deeply lacerating her shoulder, and Karen Chandler, who suffered a concussion, broken jaw, loss of teeth, and a crushed finger. Chandler and Kleiner survived the attack. Kleiner later attributed their survival to automobile headlights illuminating the interior of the room and frightening away the attacker. Tallahassee detectives later determined that the four attacks took place in a total of less than 15 minutes, within earshot of more than 30 witnesses who heard nothing. After leaving the sorority house, Bundy broke into a basement apartment eight blocks away and attacked FSU student Cheryl Thomas, dislocating her shoulder and fracturing her jaw and skull in five places. She was left with permanent deafness and equilibrium damage that ended her dance career. On Thomas's bed, police found a semen stain and a pantyhose mask containing two hairs similar to Bundy's in class and characteristics. That was a wild 15 minutes. Lisa Levy, I think, got it worse. That poor girl. Strang tore one of her nipple nipples, beat her, no, bit her deeply on her left buttock, and like sexually assaulted her with a hair mist bottle. 
And then the other girl, like, concussion, broken jaw, loss of teeth, and a crushed finger. He did this all in 15 minutes. How many people did he... 15 minutes. How many people was it? One, two, three, four, in 15 minutes. On February 8th, Bundy drove 150 miles east to Jacksonville in a stolen FSU van. In a parking lot, he approached 14-year-old Leslie Parmenter, the daughter of Jacksonville Police Department's chief of detectives, identifying himself as Richard Burton, fire department, but retreated when Parmenter's older brother arrived and challenged him. That afternoon, he backtracked 60 miles westward to Lake City. On February 12th, with insufficient cash to pay for his overdue rent and a growing suspicion that police were closing in on him, Bundy stole a car and fled Tallahassee, driving westward across the Florida Panhandle. Three days later, at around 1 a.m., he was stopped by Pensacola police officer David Lee near the Alabama state line after a wants and warrants check showed his Volkswagen Beetle was stolen. When told he was under arrest, Bundy kicked Lee's legs out from under him and took off running. Lee fired a warning shot followed by a second round, gave chase, and tackled him. The two struggled over Lee's gun before the officer finally subdued and arrested Bundy. In the stolen vehicle, there were three sets of IDs belonging to female FSU students, 21 stolen credit cards, and a stolen television set. Also found were a pair of dark rim non-prescription glasses and a pair of plaid slacks later identified as the disguise worn by Richard Burton Fire Department in Jacksonville. As Lee transported his suspect to jail, unaware that he had just arrested one of the FBI's 10 most wanted fugitives, he heard Bundy say, I wish you had killed me. This must have been just luck that yeah. he got pulled over by an officer. He said that he wished that the police officer had killed him. So either because he doesn't want to go to jail and pay for his crimes, <laughs> Nick Kink? Oh! I'm dying. <laughs> I don't know. Because he can't feel guilty. Yeah. So that's really about it. Or he doesn't want to spend the rest of his life in jail, or he doesn't want to have to tell all he's done. Following a change of venue to Miami, Bundy stood trial for the Chi Omega homicides and assaults in June 1979. The trial was covered by 250 reporters from five continents and was the first to be televised nationally in the United States. Despite the presence of five court-appointed attorneys, Bundy again handled much of his own defense. Ted was facing murder charges with a possible death sentence, and all that mattered to him apparently was that he be in charge. At the trial, crucial testimony came from Chi Omega sorority members Connie Hastings, who placed Bundy in the vicinity of the Chi Omega house that evening, and Nita Neary, who saw him leaving the sorority house clutching the oak murder weapon. Incriminating physical evidence included impressions of the bite wounds Bundy had inflicted on Lisa Levy's left buttock, which forensic onontologist Richard Suverin and Lowell Levine matched a casting of Bundy's teeth. The jury deliberated for less than seven hours before convicting him on July 24, 1979 of the Bowman and Levy murders. Three counts of attempted first-degree murder for the assaults of Kleiner, Chandler, and Thomas, and two counts of burglary. So he didn't care about being charged. He just wanted to no. be the one running the show. Yeah. Because I feel like, as we've already read about that he's very he wants to be in control yeah. he wants to be the center of attention because he likes to manipulate the he know, likes situations to yeah manipulate everything six months later a second trial took place in orlando for the abduction and murder of kimberly leach Bundy was found guilty once again after less than eight hours deliberation due principally to the testimony of an eyewitness who saw him leading leach from the schoolyard to a stolen van Important material evidence included clothing fibers with an unusual manufacturing error found in the van and on Leach's body, which matched fibers from the jacket Bundy was wearing when he was arrested. On February 10, 1980, Bundy was sentenced for a third time to death by electrocution. As the sentence was announced, he reportedly stood and shouted, Tell the jury they're wrong. The third death sentence would be the one ultimately carried out nearly nine years later. They just keep finding more evidence and more ways to So him. he's getting the death sentence. They have This is the third time that he's getting Is it the third time he's getting the death yeah, sentence? Yeah, sentenced for a third time to death. Okay. So What was the first one? 
d hanging than the second lethal injection than the know. third electrocution. I don't know. They're just really making sure that he's going to die. Die. Basically. Bundy initiated a series of interviews with Stephen Mashad and Hugh Ainsworth. He recounted his career as a thief, confirming Clover's longtime suspicion that he had shoplifted virtually everything of substance that he owned. The big payoff for me, he said, was actually possessing whatever it was I had stolen. I really enjoyed having something that I had wanted and gone out and taken. Possession proved to be an important motive for rape and murders as well. Sexual assault, he said, fulfilled his needs to totally possess his victims. The ultimate possession was, in fact, the taking of the life, he said, and then the physical possession of the remains. He was very possessive, basically. <laughs> yeah. Like everything from the stealing or the shoplifting to the sexual assault, assault to killing to revisiting the bodies. Like, that's crazy. In early 1986, an execution date of March 4th was set, but due to new evidence and confessions on Bundy's part, his execution dates were rescheduled multiple times, with his final execution date being January 24th, 1989. He confessed to Keppel that he had committed all eight of the Washington and Oregon homicides for which he was the prime suspect. He described three additional previously unknown victims in Washington and two in Oregon whom he declined to identify, if indeed he ever knew their identities. He said he left a fifth corpse down on Manson's on Taylor Mountain, but incinerated her head in Clover's fireplace. Bundy confessed to two detectives from Idaho, Utah, and Colorado that he had committed numerous additional homicides, including several that were unknown to the police. He explained that when he was in Utah, he could bring his victims back to his apartment, where he could reenact scenarios depicted in the covers of detective magazines. The night before his execution, Bundy confessed to 30 homicides, but the true total remains unknown. Published estimates have run as high as 100 or more, and Bundy occasionally made cryptic comments to encourage that speculation. Bundy died in the Rafford electric chair at 7.16 a.m. on January 24, 1989. Hundreds of revelers sang, danced, and set off fireworks in a pasture across from the prison as an execution was carried out, then cheered as the white hearse containing Bundy's corpse departed the prison. He was cremated in Gainesville, and his ashes scattered in an undisclosed location in the Cascade Range of Washington State in accordance with his will. Okay, so if it looks a little wonky to screen, it's because our battery died. died. So it's hard to get exactly the yeah. way it was. He's been like insinuating, like, or I don't know the word, but basically letting people know that he could have, have killed, killed more, a hundred or more. That's a lot. But I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah, I wouldn't honestly. be surprised either. He finally died at 7, 16 a.m. on January 24th. And people, and people were, were happy. So happy. Which I can happy. imagine, you know, if I'm, he did something to my someone I knew or whatever, I would be pretty happy too. Yeah, I'm shocked though that they actually like put his body in like a hearse. And yeah, well, I mean, they have to get out of the prison house. Are you going to get out? Just put him in a plastic bag. Sling him over somebody's shoulder. <laughs> I mean, yeah, maybe I uh, could see like in a van or something. But yeah. yeah, yeah, we left some stuff out obviously because the story is very long um, and very detailed. So we want to make sure that we kept you guys. Yeah. And, um, Att attention. Yes. Yeah, Entertain. We're able to understand. Yeah. So it's a little bit different probably from normal stories. We cut out some stuff, left some stuff in, blah blah blah. That was the crazy story of Ted Bundy. He. I think my. Like I said, Jeffrey Dahmer was my favorite of all. I think this was now favorite. this one's... It's pretty action-packed. And, like, the stuff that yeah. he did, like, he escaped two jails. <laughs> like, come on. Like, I mean, but I'll give it to him. That was pretty good. We hope you guys enjoyed this video. Let us know what you think about mm -hmm. Ted Bundy mm -hmm. down below in the comments. Um, let us know if there are other serial killers or mi murder mysteries mm -hmm. that you want us to do. I don't... Yeah, just I talk to us. We yeah. want to talk. We want to answer. Give it a thumbs up, turn on your post notifications, Yep. hit that subscribe button. Yes, subscribe, subscribe, subscribe. Recommend to your friends, family, yes. your grandmother. Yes, it helps us know if you guys like our content, if you subscribe, and if you like the video. Yeah. We'll, we'll see, see you guys, guys next Friday. Peace!